Welcome to NewsQuest Investigates podcast for this two-part investigation into one of the UK's biggest unsolved murders. I'm Mark Williams Thomas, Group Investigations Editor, and as part of this investigation, I will bring you exclusive access and compelling new evidence into the unsolved murder of Nicola Payne. Time when Nicola went missing, we were just thinking we'd had a difficult period bringing all the lads up and Nicola, like you know, and they're all just going their ways now. And we're getting our lives back for ourselves, and things are starting to look up for us, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, bang, it all changed. Over the last 30 years, I've investigated some of the biggest cases in the UK and abroad, and yet one case out of all of these cases, has really drawn me to it. I've spent the last four years in real time investigating the disappearance of 18-year-old Coventry mum, Nicola Payne. I've been given exclusive access to police files and documents and have filmed and recorded interviews with key witnesses, which has led to significant development and new information, all with the purpose of helping the police to one day solve this mystery and finally give Nicola's family the answers they so deserve. This is a story, uh, an incident, uh, that is etched on the consciousness of everybody in Coventry. It was Saturday the 14th of December 1991, a very cold, damp and in parts foggy day, when it is alleged that Nicola had left her seven-month-old son Owen with her boyfriend Jason Cook at his parents' house in Winston Avenue, Coventry to walk a short distance, a maximum of eight minutes, to where she lived with her parents across an area called the Black Pad. She never arrived. I'm going to start my investigation in Coventry by meeting Nicola's parents, Marilyn, who is also known as Maz and John. Hello, Maz. Hello, Mark. I asked Maz to tell me about the day Nicola went missing. John rung me and asked me, had Nicola come to see me? And I said, no. Why? He said, well, she hasn't come home. And I said, well, what about Owen? Oh, Owen's there. They've got Owen, but Nicola's not there. I kept having pains, thinking there was something wrong. But I never thought it was my family. I just knew there was something wrong. Nicola was very uh, outward going. She she liked she liked life. She liked enjoying herself. She was very uh, very friendly with everybody. And she was the youngest of the family. She was spoiled, especially by her dad. Like you know, Nicola was looking forward to going into her own house. Like you know, she would uh, help to buy a house. Like and we'd done it all up. John tells me about the last time he saw Nicola. I'd been at work all week and I got home on the Friday evening. Uh, Nicola was there with uh, Owen. Marilyn had gone to work, like, you know, because she works at old people's home and she was working all night, like, she was on a night shift. And then uh, it was about eight o'clock in the evening, Jason come round. And she says she's going to stop at Jason's for the night. I said, Tara to her, I'll give her a kiss, like, you know, my lovely little grandson. And that's it. And never thought nothing of it. And that's the last time you saw Nicola? The last time I've seen her. Maz thinks that quite a lot of people know more than what they are saying. I mean, 12 people at least I could speak out to myself so and know. I would know, that I would know that know about her? I feel they know all about it and were, if they didn't do it, they would be knowing what was in on it as well, definitely. But they're all frightened because you don't know what will happen if they're the one that says something. 
So what were the first few weeks like after Nicola's disappearance? It wasn't just one night, it was five weeks. I sat on a, one end of the sofa and I wouldn't move. I wouldn't move, I wasn't going, I wasn't doing nothing. I couldn't do it, I had to stop. My sons used to lie on the floor because my John wouldn't, wouldn't have the doors locked. He said, because if Nick is there, she can just get in. We always kept the same telephone. Even though we've moved, we managed to get them to keep us the same all this time. Um, and I remember saying to my sister, oh, I hope I haven't got to wait 12 months for him to find Nicola. And that, that always sticks in my head about from that day as well. And she said, you won't, you won't. She was always a good girl. girl. She'd do her best to help, but you can't. People can't give you what, what they can find out, can they? But there is people out there that know. I just really, really hope that this, this would let somebody just have a little look and see, because it draws all the family apart, really, you know. I've always asked God to help me find the remains now, as that would be, so at least I would feel I could leave this earth knowing a bit more, feeling better. Maz and John and the family have had their lives torn apart by the disappearance of Nicola, a torment that no family should ever have to go through, but made worse by the fact that nobody has been brought to justice and they have no idea where Nicola could be. All they have are memories. We've had this up now 28 years, haven't we? Yeah, and the eyes always look like she follows you. If yeah. I look that way, I feel that she... Whenever you look at it... It, it does, it she follows me. It. it was John who first reported his daughter missing. Well, of course, I got back just after 12.30 it was, and I walked in and thought, well, she hasn't come back yet. So I waited five, ten minutes, she weren't there. She still hadn't come, so I rung Jason up then, Jason's house, and he told me she'd left 20 minutes ago. So I said, well, she should be here by now, and he said she's walking, I thought, well... That's unusual, Nicola had never walked anywhere. I give it another five minutes, I thought, well, I'll go and look for her. I walked down as far as the field, couldn't see, I could see across the field, couldn't see her coming this that, the other, and I thought, queer this is. So I went back home, I thought, wondering what to do next. That's when I, I thought, it's something not right here. That's when I started panicking. And that's when they decided to phone the police. You read about these things in the paper and it, you never think it'll ever happen to you and it's happened. What do we do? What do we do? Even though this crime is over 30 years old, I still believe people in this community hold the clues. As part of my reinvestigation, I have been given unprecedented access to West Midlands Police case files. I now need to start to rebuild a picture of Nicola's disappearance with the help of my colleague Rebecca. One question I want to consider early on is was Nicola alive on Saturday or could she have come to harm on the Friday night? So 14th of December 1991, we know Nicola was at her boyfriend's parents' house. Yeah. What do we know after that? So it's about lunchtime on the Saturday. So she leaves here and she walks down this road towards the black pad, enters the black pad, but of course that's where everything, the trail goes dead. So she was going to her parents' house to pick up a set of keys? Yeah. It was to pick up the keys to the house that they were due to move into. So you're talking about a life that's literally about to move on to the next stage. Mm. Everything was, she had everything going for her. And her child was left here with her boyfriend. It just doesn't make any sense that she walks down there and disappears. A busy area as well, isn't it? You yeah. know, it's built up. Residential, yeah. So I think our focus now has to be going through the files to identify witnesses. Did anyone see her mm. on that lunchtime? Did anybody hear or see anything suspicious? Mm. Let's go and see those people. Uh, 
distance of time is always difficult for people's memory, uh, but hopefully such a significant moment and it has received huge publicity yeah, yeah. that they'll still remember that detail. Yeah, absolutely. And let's get hold of the initial police officer that dealt with the investigation in 1991. Yeah. And let's get him down here and let's let him talk me through that investigation in the early stages. I've got hold of retired Superintendent Malcolm Ross. I don't want him to meet me at the black pad to talk through the case. So Malcolm, you led the initial investigation right from the start. Tell me what you were told about Nicola. Okay, I was told on the Sunday evening that uh, she'd gone missing on the Saturday and uh, the usual inquiries had been done. And just give me a sense of what the initial thoughts were of the police. Young girl, lunchtime on a Saturday, vanishes. Absolutely. Um, uh, not happened before. Uh, no suggestion that, that she was uh, um, going to leave. Very, very strange. And, and by Monday, when nothing had been heard from her, uh, my, my fears were, were raised. And that's why we launched into a major investigation. The initial police response was limited. The police policy file stating that the duty senior officer is of the opinion that the report is just a misper, a girl gone to an acid house party, and that there was no need to involve CID. It would take a few days before the police realised how serious Nicholas' disappearance was and increased their search efforts. The old boots were a brand new pair of very similar boots. They even got the price tag still on them. So those were they. Okay, it's worth it. Um, and any underclothing, she was either wearing a white bra and knickers or one of these white teddies, you know. Uh, so Malcolm, what do we know about Nicola leaving the house on that Saturday lunchtime? Well, we know that she was here with uh, Jason and the baby, Jason's mom and uh, other members of the family. And Jason's mom was in the window waiting for a friend to come and take a shop in. And she was standing in the window and she saw Nicola come out of the front door and walk diagonally across the grass here. Not, not, she didn't go down the path, she'd come across the grass. And then she walked on down here and then she was seen by the lady who was with her husband in a car discussing her husband buying her boots for Christmas. And she saw Nicola and said, those are the sorts of boots I want, to, want you to buy me. They were the boots that Nicola was wearing. And then there was the man down here, farther on, who was repairing his car, <coughs> that knows, who knew that she, was, uh, uh, she lived here with a boyfriend or stayed here with a boyfriend. Uh, and she, he, she walked past him and then a few minutes later he looked behind him and she disappeared into the fog uh, along the path on the black pad and of course that's the route to her mom and dad's house where she lived <coughs> and she was going across to her mom and dad's house to pick some keys up and also to uh, I think get some nappies. How far is that? Uh, no more than 10 minutes uh, I wouldn't have thought straight across the black pad uh, and uh, no doubt she's done it time and time again. There were three key reported sightings on the Saturday. Malcolm Brannan, he came forward four days after Nicola went missing and says he was outside working on his car when he saw Nicola walk past his house at around 12.15 towards the black pad where he lost sight of her. He said he knew Nicola. Dawn McKay says she saw Nicola around 12.20, walking along Winston Avenue, but describes Nicola going the other way, away from the black pad. And then Parker, who says that just before midday, she saw Nicola leaving the Cook family address. They exchanged greetings and then walked opposite ways, with Nicola walking off towards the direction of the black pad. Parker recalls at the time of seeing Nicola, she was wearing a brown leather jacket and pixie boots. Just give me a sense of the scale of the operation that you were running here over those few days. On the Monday I geared up the search uh, and over the next few days we had dozens and dozens of officers here. We had mounted officers, dog officers, uh, uh, helicopters, search teams uh, and uh, we, we, we went through here uh, cutting all the bracken down, right. searching for it. It was, it was a a really intense search and then later on 
uh, after speaking to the family, we found that Nicky had, had uh, wore a, a little necklace. And I remember doing it again then to see if we could find the necklace. Okay. So this place was searched for days and days. Um, the problem, the main problem was the weather. Of course, it snowed. The search had to be cancelled for two days because it was pointless searching, right. particularly for the necklace when the snow was on the ground. Um, but uh, it went on, the search went on for weeks. It quickly became apparent to the family that something must be wrong and they all became involved in the search. They spoke with a neighbour, Pat Carter, who told them that he'd walked his dog earlier over the black pad and he saw two men acting suspiciously and heard a woman scream. He also saw a car at the time, which was quite distinctive. The police now needed urgently to identify the car and the two men, but at the same time they received another significant lead. Someone kept calling the pains, saying that they had seen Nicola in company with a man with a moustache in various locations and a note had been thrown into the Payne's garden saying she had been seen with someone who matched the description at the time she went missing. The case was now receiving considerable media attention and as a result lots of information was coming into the incident room. These included two separate reports of disturbed ground at Coombe Abbey where Nicola could be buried, a manager of a nearby pub saying that he had heard Nicola is buried with another body and at least 10 different people named as having killed Nicola, and a medium saying Nicola is buried. I've spent hours going through the case files and have identified a person who I think is a key witness, who I believe has been ignored, but who could hold vital information. I'm meeting Ron and his wife back at the location where he thinks he may have seen something connected to Nicola's disappearance. So Ron, here we are. You would call this the bomb crater? Yeah. In your own words, tell me what you saw. Well, I was on that bank. Right. Trying to fly a model helicopter. And I saw this, this girl sat here. She was sat or crouched right, right there. And she so appeared, she's here? Yeah. She was about like this, but crouched down. Crouched down because I could see her. I thought it's strange for her to be sat right. on, on frozen ground because it was freezing fog at the okay. time. So tell me the weather is really cold. It was very cold. Freezing fog. Freezing fog, um, yeah. And this is Saturday afternoon. Yes. I right. Couldn't, couldn't make so it out. You couldn't make it out really clear. I couldn't see who it was. No. I could see that it was, it appeared to be a girl. Right. What did you think? I thought, shall I go over to her and see if she's all right? And then I thought, no, they're waiting to jump out and grab my helicopter. <laughs> OK. That was my immediate So your thought. thought was there was somebody else there? Yeah. Right. I, I, I got the impression there was. Right. But So it, although you didn't see someone, you formed the impression that there was probably somebody else there? Yeah. So at that stage, we're talking Saturday afternoon, you don't know that Nicola Payne is missing? No. no. When do you become aware and what do you do? As soon as I saw it on the television, I said, I said to Rhoda, I said, I wonder if that was anything to do with that girl I saw. So, so this, is ninth, this is December 1991. Yeah. And do you then get, they, the police do a review years and years later, do you get a visit by the police then? No. no. Nothing at all? No. I don't know if that was Nicola, but I think it's a very significant piece of information. How do you feel? You've lived with this for years. Yeah, since, since the event, it's, it just shatters me to think that it could have been Nicola and nothing has been done. What if it is Nicola? What if Nicola is here? Oh, I don't, I just I don't, don't know. know. I don't know, I'll cope with it. So they appear absolutely genuine. They've tried for years to get the police to follow up on their sighting. And this is something they reported in 1991, but in the review, it never got picked up. And until today, I didn't know about them. But now I think that could well have been Nicola. And if it is Nicola, that places her here at 3.30 
on that Saturday afternoon and it changes the whole timeline of the police investigation. I'm meeting back up with Malcolm Ross to ask him about the early days of the investigation. So the first 24, 48 hours of any major investigation are really significant. Did you get a breakthrough? Yes, we did. So we're at the, the top end of the black pad now. Um, th at that time, there were no gates here and no fences. And we have a witness that's walking his dog on this black pad area here. And he sees a man by a bush to start with. And he thinks that man's urinating. And he carries on walking and he can hear a, a, a car revving its engine. And as he comes around by this area here, he sees the Ford Capri, the blue one with the sk skirts on, and he sees another man there. And he walks past that and he's, he's going to walk in a loop and come back. And just as he's gone past the Capri, bear in mind the fog, he hears a scream. And when he comes back round, the car's gone and the car must have come down this Because this is the way. only route in this and out. This is the only route to this point here. Gosh. And what connects that vehicle to the two suspects you arrested? The vehicle was, was uh, very um, distinctive. Made some, the detectives on duty at that time made some inquiries, traced the car. And on the evening of Sunday the 15th of December, the Capri owner, Nigel Barwell, and his brother-in-law, Thomas O'Reilly, are both treated as witnesses and asked to attend the police station to give statements. There was a further development on the Sunday when witness Patrick Carter came forward with new information. The witness comes forward and he goes to the police station to be interviewed and sees the car in the car park and said, that's the car. Oh, so a positive identification? Yes. Barwell and O'Reilly live locally and spent a lot of their time together. Both have previous convictions Barwell the most serious for arson, wounding and robbery, and O'Reilly mainly for motoring offences. Another witness comes forward. Richard Dowie says that he saw on Saturday around 10.30am a blue Ford Capri being driven down Winston Avenue towards Cardinal Wiseman School. The Capri became a significant line of inquiry for the police. And what is it that put them here? Were they connected in, in some way to the community? Did they know Nicola? They were local men. It was the relationship between the two men, the car, and, and uh, the witness saying that he heard a scream, right. which was significant. So the car was, was taken in and, and uh, subsequently forensically examined. Lots of discussions took place over the retention of Barwell's Capri for forensic examination. A senior officer ruled that the car could not be held and it had to be returned. And from reading the files, I understand there were some issues in those early days around the retention of the car. Yes, the car was released by the police on the Sunday. And when I took ch charge of the investigation on the Monday, I got the car back. And it was then that the, it was um, forensically examined. The decision was to arrest Barwell and O'Reilly on suspicion of the abduction of Nicola Payne and for the Ford Capri to be seized again and all clothes and intimate samples to be obtained, as well as both their homes searched. Both were interviewed and remained in custody until late on Tuesday the 18th. So you've got two men in custody, mm -hmm. you're interviewing them. What are they saying about their movements on the Saturday? Well, they're both adamant that they were in a car park in Rugby, that they'd gone to Rugby to buy some drugs and that they'd fallen asleep in, a, in their car, um, in a car park in Rugby. Well, we made inquiries about that um, and uh, th there's no evidence at all that that car was overnight in the car park. Had it been, it would have been ticketed uh, and we, we traced the, the, the gentleman that's responsible for doing that and he was adamant that car was not in the car park at Rugby. Uh, and, uh, and we got to the stage where we, at, with the evidence that we got and the information that we got at that stage, we had to release them uh, because there wasn't enough evidence to charge them. During interview, O'Reilly stated that he took two blankets from home with him that weekend to use to sleep on, which he placed back in the airing cupboard on his return. However, police established with O'Reilly's mother that only one blanket was returned. Bowell's wife was spoken to. She confirmed his story and said that on the Sunday he had vacuumed his car. Both Bowell and O'Reilly are released and agreed to take part in an ID parade scheduled for the 23rd of December. 
Mac will be really helpful in my very initial stages where we are at the moment. Do you have a thought and a, a hypothesis of what happened to Nicola? From the very first day of me being involved in this, my view is that she has been abducted, that uh, she's not the sort of person that would have uh, gone off and not contacted her family, her child. Yeah. Uh, so she's been abducted, I think, and uh, I think, sadly, she's been murdered. Any idea where her body could be, in what state it would be? Well, uh, where, she, where her body is, I, d I don't know. It's certainly not on the black pad. Police had been given Colin Jones as an alibi by Barwell and O'Reilly, so they wanted to check this out. Jones was seen and stated that he had no arrangements to meet and they didn't. At this time, it was not just the disappearance of Nicola Payne that West Midlands Police were investigating. They were also running a major investigation into the abduction and murder of Judy Dart. Words will never be able to express my regret that Julie Dart had to be killed, but I did warn what would happen if anything went wrong. I still require the same monies as before, and if you want to avoid any further prostitutes' lives, place an ad in the personal column of the Sun to read, Let's try again for Julie's sake. In the letter there were details of how Julie had died. Three blows to the back of the head and strangled. Strangulation had not been released to the press, but when the pathologist looked again at the body, he confirmed that's how Julia died. So there was no doubt that the writer of the letter was the killer and was prepared to kill again. Part of that investigation was based in Birmingham. Um, and uh, the similarities between the two cases with, uh, with Nicola Payne going missing, and of course we had to compare uh, and we linked in with the, the Birmingham uh, end of the, of the uh, Julie Dart and, uh, uh, inquiry um, and, uh, and cross-referenced and to see if there's any similarities. There were connections, of course, that we found subsequently with that inquiry and Coventry, yes. uh, with a sheet with a laundry mark on from a Coventry company and so on. Uh, so we, we, we had to look at that. I know that we'll never have Julie back. But I also know that justice has been done at last. And that beast Sands, and that is all he is, has got what he just deserves. Yeah. And we've got the verdict we all wanted to. And this is it. You know, we prayed for this for 18 months. So Julie Dart's uh, abduction, murder, and the connection of Michael Sands with Coventry is quite significant, isn't yeah. it? I mean, what's the likelihood of an individual oh, no. who is a murderer Woman's vanished, Nicola's vanished, yet he connected to Coventry. Well, uh, his connection, he, he had something to do with the Black & Decker company here. And then, as I said, there was the laundry mark on, on a sheet that was used in that Yorkshire inquiry that had been cleaned here. Police got new information about Barwell's Ford Capri. Louise Sandbrook says that on Saturday afternoon, the day of Nicola's disappearance, she saw Barwell's V-Reg Capri in Dumrose Close and O'Reilly was with him, and says that the car was backed up to a fence, over which was waste ground leading to River Sour, and the boot of the car was open. Sandbrook refused at the time to make a statement. Operation Heat was now a huge investigation, multi-layered and attracting considerable media attention. It involved 103 officers, including mounted branch, dog handlers, and underwater search teams, all scouring the riverbanks. Various items were recovered, including a tent on the waste ground near to the river, which would later turn out to be a major breakthrough in the case. An intensive search carried out by over 100 police officers has failed to find any clues and there is deep concern for her safety. Six days after Nicola vanished in the hope of jogging someone's memory, police ran a reconstruction. A woman police officer retraced her steps, but no hard evidence was ever found and sightings started flooding in. Witnesses stated that they had seen Nicola in various locations hours after she was reported missing. And another stated she was on a National Express coach from Birmingham to London. None of these sightings came to anything. Both Barwell and O'Reilly were bailed to attend an identification parade on the 23rd of December and then on the 21st of February. 
both failed to attend on both occasions. This intelligence report shows Barwell and a man using Peter Ball's passport travelled from Dover to Calais on the day of the ID parade. This police files show it was O'Reilly using Ball's passport. So you've got two men due to come back for bail. They don't come back for bail. The purpose of coming back for bail, as I understand it, was they were going to come to an ID parade, is that right? That's right. They, the, the ID parade was, was arranged. They, they failed to turn up. They eventually turned up uh, after some weeks. Uh, their appearance had changed. And how significant had their appearance changed? Well, they they uh, had the hair done differently, and one had got a moustache, and and so on and so forth, um, and uh, and nobody picked them out. It was not until 2007 that the case received close attention again. This time by a dedicated major investigation team, and then in 2012 the case was fully reopened when DCI Martin Slevin took charge. It was the first time I'd met uh, John and Marilyn. Um, and one of the most difficult questions I asked both of them was, were they reconciled to the fact that Nicola was dead? Um, and I, met, I had mixed, a mixed reaction because it was quite important to, to broach that topic because I was going to be talking in terms of finding a body and arresting people for murder. And if they weren't reconciled to that fact, it was going to make it increasingly were difficult. Were they? Uh, Marilyn was. John obviously lived in hope that Nicola would one day walk back through the door. Um, but I think after the conversation I had with them, they both came to the, the realisation that now we were investigating uh, Nicola's murder. Yeah. You had no doubt that she had been murdered when you took on the investigation? Yeah, absolutely. My, my, um, the information that I had um, indicated that Nicola was probably dead within a number of hours of her being abducted. So what was it that got the case reopened in 2012? Yeah, we had uh, some strands of intelligence that indicated that uh, a man by the name of David Judge, who is now deceased, um, had actually uh, knocked Nicola over. But what was significant was that he owned and was driving a, a dark-coloured Ford Capri. Um, and significantly, David Judge had committed suicide six weeks after Nicola's disappearance. He hadn't left a suicide note. It was completely unexpected and there was no reason for him to do that. And just one person telling you this or was, was more than one person telling uh, you that he was involved? We uh, initially thought we had two strands of intelligence. I identified that there was actually three. And we made two arrests uh, whilst we were carrying out a detailed search of an area in, in Henley Green in Coventry. And whilst those arrests were going on, we had further people coming forward telling us the same piece of information and intelligence. It was too much to ignore. And that's why I arrested two people, interviewed them, but was able to eliminate them from the inquiry. The family's hopes were dashed again. Coming up in episode two, in 1996, police search a house a few feet down from where Nicola was staying with her boyfriend and she vanished. Policemen with shovels, two dogs trained to find human remains. The garden of a house just yards from where Nicola Payne was last seen. The strong witness comes forward with startling intelligence. He again had the car, he cut everything out, he cleaned the boot inside the car, um, not just a little wipe, he got the back out and and everything. Would have been about 10, 11, definitely before lunch, 10 or 11. He had a caravan, um, which was part of the, uh, the, the back of the, the garages. He also cleaned that out. Remarkable new information is received, leading to a search of Coombe Abbey. I noticed two men moving quite close together in the wooded area to my left. I heard one shouting at the other one as if he was shouting at him or giving him instruction. Does a murder of another woman, Barbara Finn, in Coventry, just two months earlier, connect? And this is where this taxi driver had been marched and brought by two men, potentially fitting their description, but had made that significant comment to the taxi driver that we're the people responsible for Barbara Finn and Nicola Payne. And a witness comes forward saying he was told where Nicola's body was dumped. When we were sitting in the pub talking, he was saying that, they didn't mean to kill Nicola Payne, it was an accident, but um, nobody would believe them. 
Very sadly, since this programme was filmed and recorded, Maz has passed away. Special thanks to the family of Nicola Payne, West Midlands Police and Peter Fording Specialist Group International.